Well, here we are in Acts, the second chapter, verse 42. We've been here before, and we talked, when we were here before, we talked about the ten signs of a healthy church that are in verses 42 through 47. I want to pay a special attention to one, and that's the first sign of a healthy church was the apostles' teaching. Notice, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. Now, what? When we originally studied this passage, we found something very important about that. <laughs> All of us who wear mics, we learned an important lesson here. Many years ago, when they first mic'd me, I learned an important lesson. I didn't turn it off and went to the bathroom. That's a... Uh, a moment, a, pa a moment in a pastor's life you don't want to repeat. Um, that, uh, nor the congregation especially. Uh, 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 what I was saying is that what is important about this phrase, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, it was the first sign, was that that was, an, that was an imperfect paraphrastic. Now, why that was important is that the, uh, Luke set that thing up with a paraphrastic imperfect and then ran a series from that. That was the first of a series of 10 imperfect tenses. So it became a marker in the Greek language, point one, point two, or the first sign, the second sign. That's how we, that's how we discovered 10 signs here was the way Luke set it up. And so I wanted to come back to that original because he made a big point about the first sign of a healthy church. And, of course, this was the, the, the early church. It was called the apostles' teaching. And notice what it says about them. They were continually devoting themselves. It takes responsibility to put yourself in a, a posture to learn, and then you have to be in the right place to get the information. And uh, for us, that means, for us, Doctrinal Studies Bible Church, that means a couple of things. Most churches, and I, I'm, I'm not opposed to this now, don't misunderstand me, most churches the pastors have been taught to expository teach. They'll go through the Bible expository. If they're, if they're men that are gifted, if they're truly gifted with teacher, then the Holy Spirit is going to nudge them to go through the scriptures systematically. And so they do that. They, they, they take a passage and they teach it expository. Uh, it's been famously called by, by young guys who go to seminary, they call it three points in a poem. Three points in a poem. You, and it's a good system. There's nothing wrong with it. Usually the three, the, the A, B, and C, or the one, two, and three, uh, are well done, and there are great expository teachers out there. We don't do that very much. We do some of it, but we don't do that much because we did, we're here for spiritual growth. We're not here to persuade you or to do other things with you. What we're here to do is to feed your soul for growth. And, what, and how we teach is categorical. We believe that you have, to, you have to go from milk to meat in the Word of God. You have to go from basic stuff to advanced stuff. Because that's just the way the Christian life is. There are so many struggles in the devil's world. There are so many struggles in your personal lives. There's so much stuff going on, we would say. But you need a good, a good handle on the Word of God. And categorically is how you do it. What's the Bible say about marriage? What's it say about sin? What's it say about divorce? What's it say about health issues? What's it say about suffering? And yada, yada. And the list goes on just because that's the way we face our problems in our life. So we teach categorically. To teach solid categorical doctrine, you, you, have to, you have to teach under an ICE principle. So rather than 
expository principle, we teach an ICE principle because we feel so strongly about spiritual growth maturing. If you went to college, you would do a 100 course, then you would go to a 200 course, and then you would go to a three, four, five uh, level courses. That's categorical growth. That's how they, the school system teaches that way. The Greeks taught that way, by the way. Now, we believe in order to do that properly, you, you, we ice teach. Ice is just, it, ice means isagogics. You got to have a good historical background to whatever you're teaching about. It requires a lot of historical research, biblically. Uh, the E, uh, the C stands for categorical, and the E stands for exegeting. We believe that a lot of times the, the clarity of what's being said is brought more fully clear to you by knowing the Greek and Hebrew language. <clears throat> and a good example is verse 42, where Luke, in this passage of scriptures, 42 through 47, laid out 10 signs of a healthy church, and he did it in the Greek language. No doubt about it. And... And, and, and you learn from Paul to teach that way, and all the guys that learned from Paul taught that way. They all taught that way. <clears throat> so, so I'm back to the, what I want us to understand today is why we teach the way we teach. This makes us different from a lot of churches because most of them, almost all, the, almost the, almost all theological schools teach expository that's what, how I was taught <clears throat> almost all of them are going to teach you that way in fact my people when I where I was trained when I told them I wanted I wanted to teach the languages because I found them to be important in my life they told me I should never do that I should never do that <clears throat> and I have a lot of people that come to this church that agree with that what do I need the language for? Well, for example, 10 signs of a healthy church. They're laid out in such a way that you couldn't miss them. But if you just read the English, you could miss them. You would, you would know there were 10 signs of a healthy church when you read through that. You'd really have to figure something out. But I didn't have to figure anything out. When I exited, I went, whoa, there they are. So anyhow, it's a, it's a choice. The reason I chose to do this, and I've been schooled in both, both I've been schooled in both schools. The reason I did because I grew under ice teaching. I grew like crazy under it, and I wasn't growing under the other method. I was always hungry for more. <clears throat> when you teach categorically, you always leave a church with a, with a doggy bag unless you give me an open end to the to the hour. <laughs> I was up at the youth camp. <clears throat> the I'm not, leadership camp is what they call it. The leadership camp, uh, Crossroad Acad the Academy. <clears throat> and I, I really like home. I really like home teaching. I like small groups. I like sat down. I like I like engagement. I, I like all those things. Time limit requires. You to, you can't do a lot of that. You got to get it and get out because people will. I'm only going to give you 35 minutes. <laughs> so you have to hit it. That's okay with me. Look, it's it's your time. I got all day. But when you go out to a meeting like that, I say to the kids a couple of times, you want to shut you want to shut it down for a moment, and take a break, and they went like, no way. Feed us. That's why we came here. Why'd you come here? <laughs> We came out here this weekend to be fed. What you come for? I, mean, I came to feed you, buddy. And so away we went. I mean, and that was, at, that's the way I used to teach. I used to love that. I love that open-endedness where it goes like, just keep feeding me and I'll tell you when to stop. And I finally gave up. I surrendered to them. I said, look, I, I'm done. I got to go home. Uh, but what a wonderful group of kids. I'll tell you. 
I am so excited about the youth that I see in America right now. I'm so excited about it. The last three years, I've seen the most wonderful group of kids on fire for God that I haven't seen since the 60s and 70s. And uh, I'm pretty excited about where, 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 where the church is headed, spiritually speaking. I am excited about that. Well, so one of the, they were continually devoting themselves, that's your responsibility, to the apostolic or the apostles teaching that becomes guys like my responsibility. What am I going to teach you? If you give me your time, and believe me, I believe that's precious. The time you give me, the money you give me, that I can prepare myself to feed you, that's phenomenal to me. I take none of that for granted. I've been bo on both sides of that street, and I'm thankful for everything you do for me. And so here we are at this idea. Now, the word apostle comes from the Greek word, and I don't know if I spelled it anywhere in your paper, but it's spelled A-P-O-S-T-O-L-O-S. You, so you can see the English word apostle in it. Uh, one more time for you. A-P-O-S-T-O-L-O-S. -O -O that's the word apostle as, as a noun form that's used here. And the, you can see the English word, you can see the word, English word apostle comes from that. Apostle. Now, when you go to the, when you go to the verb form to find the meaning of a Greek word, see, a noun don't tell you that. So you go to the Greek. The Greek form of this word is A-P-O-S-T-E-L-L-O. Apostello. A-P-O-S-T-E-L-L-O. And here's what that word means. Here's what an apostle means. It's, it means one. Now, it's technical because it comes out, out of a whole lot of different ideas. But the basic idea behind this word, and it's an enormous word. It's a word that's connected with all kinds of authority. Somebody that's in supreme command authority uh, 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 gives a decree of apostleship to somebody who delivers that, who is sent on a mission to deliver that specific message specifically as stated. Are you with me? He's called an apostle when that supreme commander of a military or a, a seizure of a company or a president of the United States, whatever, when he selects somebody in apostleship, it is because he is to deliver, he's sent on a mission to deliver specific information specifically as documented. So that was a really big word. And I, I want to talk about that today. I want you to understand the, the uh, power of that word that's connected here when it says the apostles' teaching. Well, who, who are these guys? Well, when we get to Acts 2, they're no longer called the 12. They're called the 11. Now, sometimes they're always called the 12, even though there's 11. Sometimes they're called 12 because they earn that reputation, the 12 disciples of Jesus. But in Acts 2, the 12 are only 11 because Judas Iscariot has committed suicide. When it refers to the apostles, we're talking about the 12 who became the 11 are called apostles. Now, they were called apostles when they were still traveling with Jesus. In his earthly ministry, the 12 were called the apostles. And it's important, you know, when he says from supreme command... I'm going to make 
I'm going to allow you to come into apostleship. I'm going to teach that today, and it's really important. And have I had prayer? I know my engine started. I was just about ready to get in this thing. Let's pray. Give you a moment of silence. Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. Can't study it in carnality. That's my point. Carnality, evidence of carnality, personal sin. Could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, avert sins. Your responsibility, my responsibility as a believer indwelt by the Holy Spirit, church age, new covenant, is to confess sin, get you out of carnality back into spirituality so that the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit can teach you the truth of the Word of God, for it is that truth that sets you free from the cosmic system of lies. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, you do that in privacy, you do it through your priesthood. If you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you. That's that restoration back to spirituality. And so, our Father, we're thankful today for this exercise, this spiritual exercise important for study, for spiritual growth, not just for learning but for living, uh, the ministry of the Holy, indwelling Holy Spirit. I pray today, Father, as we look at the apostles' teaching, uh, how that has, how that was the key to the, to the first church and how it has transpired into the importance of our church today in the 21st century. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm, I'm going to show you three aspects of the idea of the apostles' teaching today that is found in Acts 2 of 42. I'm going to give you three ideas. The first, as an apostle of Jesus Christ was qualified, this is very important, an apostle, when, he, when they are given apostleship, when the disciples of Jesus are given apostleship, that's a big deal because they are now capable of taking under the authority of Jesus Christ to the world the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ verbatim. as if he was doing it himself. The emperor or the commanding general, whoever that supreme leader would be, when he assigned apostleship, that person went out on behalf of him as if he was there in person. Right, do you understand that? Well, that's the background to this word. The apostles of Jesus Christ, therefore, were qualified to teach whatever was in that mandate, whatever the mandate of a, whatever the, the whatever that mandate was, was to teach and to train. They were qu highly qualified. They were like seals, you know, on a mission. They were highly qualified for whatever they were sent on to. It would be outlined and prescribed by what they were assigned to by the supreme command. And they would be able, in that mandate, they would be absolutely capable in their training as disciples. They would have been absolutely qualified to do that in their whatever exercise of training and leadership ability that would be necessary to complete the mission. That's very important. You understand that. And so we, we have the apostles of Jesus Christ who could be assigned at some point were assigned apostleship duty. They would go out and they would come back and resume discipleship training. Because they still had the supreme commander. And he would do that often. He would assemble. And, and this group grew. It started with 12 and it wound up 70 some, right? He could call them all in. And it, okay. when they came back, that apostleship, they didn't come, they come back, then they went back into discipleship training and getting ready for another assignment business. And you have to understand that's how this stuff was working. Okay? So the apostles of Jesus Christ were qualified to teach and to train disciples of Jesus in the basic doctrines of what we would call today New Covenant teaching. Now, what is interesting is that one example of the apostles' teaching would be Jesus. Let me just give you one example. 
when Jesus at the Last Supper, Jesus at the Last Supper introduced a new teaching to the Old Covenant. A new teaching. And it was at Passover. It was the Passover meal. At the Passover meal. Now, for you to understand the importance of this Passover meal and what he's going to do at this meal in transition from Old Covenant to New Covenant is phenomenal. And so I'm going to, I'm going to, I can't read it all. I don't have the time to read it all and go over Exodus 12. But you sure need to understand. Listen, if you don't understand Exodus 12, you're not going to understand Luke 22 turning into 1 Corinthians 11, 25 and 26, which is the Eucharist. You will never get it. Our Eucharist in 1 Corinthians 11, you know, the bread and the cup, it comes from Luke 22, Luke 22 came, comes from Exodus 12. Where do you get the idea of bread and blood? Where do you get the idea of bread and blood? Where do you get the idea of the bread and the cup of the blood? Where do you get that idea? You get it from Exodus, the 12th chapter. Unleavened bread and the blood of the lamb over the doorpost business. If you don't understand Exodus 12, you'll not understand Luke 22, and you won't understand the transition and the wonderful grace of the new covenant Eucharist. You will never understand what an enormous thing God did. And Exodus 12 is all about redemption or the Exodus. Luke 22 is all about that, and so is 1 Corinthians 11, take, taken to its fulfillment in Christ dying on a cross, being buried and raised from the dead. And what he's going to do at the Last Supper is unbelievable, lights out, nuts. Now, you can read about this in Luke, the 22nd chapter, 14 through 23. I want you to look at 19 and 20, where he makes the transition, where he moves from old covenant teaching to new covenant teaching. There's no doubt he did it because we know it from 1 Corinthians 11. Here's what he did. He took the old covenant cup. And he said, this cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. That's the cup. He held up the old covenant, which was shadow Christology, blood, lamb, blood over the post, the Passover, remember that? Passover, that's where the word Passover comes. Passover angel went over, and those who had the blood didn't die. Those who, you know, why? Then he comes, he comes to the bread. He said, this bread is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. That's that unleavened bread business that comes out of Exodus 12. That's, see, he, he says that. He's got the old, that's old covenant bread, unleavened, and that's old covenant blood, that's shadow Christology, the lamb blood, the lamb. Paul got it. Paul got it in 1 Corinthians, uh, the fifth chapter, verse 7, when he called, we called Jesus' crucifixion the Passover lamb who gave, gave his life body Blood for the sins of the world. John got it in John the ninth, in the first chapter of John. John the Baptist speaking, 
said of Jesus Christ, Behold the Lamb of God that's come to take away the sin of the world. Peter got it when he wrote in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 that it was the blood of Christ, historically, that became the precious blood of redemption. A lamb without blemish and spot. Perfect in birth and perfect in death. These guys got it. You know where all that transpired? You know where all that th theology transpired at the Last Supper? Do you know where it was all instigated? Exodus, the 12th chapter. <laughs> and now we begin a transition from Old Covenant to New Covenant doctrine. Old Covenant doctrine through Jesus Christ is fulfilled. You know, Matthew 5, 17, didn't come to destroy it. It came to fulfill it. Here's where it begins, the transition from Old Covenant to New Covenant, a switching of doctrines. Not that they're going to be different, but they're going to, the old one is going to be fulfilled and brought into the new one. If it's not fulfilled, it doesn't come new. It becomes new because it's fulfilled, and a new idea, a new theology is attached to it. In the Old Testament, when they did that, when they did that, they, when they did the Passover meal, they were looking for the coming of Christ, first coming. When we, do, when we do it now, having all the doctrine, all the things that Christ fulfilled, we toast it to the second coming of Christ. Please tell me you know that. If you'd gone here a, a year, you know that. One year. Spend one year with us. One year. So you know this stuff. One of the assignments of the apostles. Oh, listen to me now. Here's Acts 2.42. One of their assignments when he leaves is for them to take up the teachings of transition from old covenant to new covenant thinking. And they really struggled with it. They, they struggled with it. That's Okay. It's okay, you struggle as long as you, as long as you come through the struggle with new covenant thinking. If you come through the struggle and you have old covenant thinking, you didn't win the struggle. In, in Doctrinal Studies Bible Church, New Covenant Eucharist, we always read 1 Corinthians 11, 22 uh, 24, 25 is the passage when he says this, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he's talking about the bread, right? But he called it his body. The body. He who knew no sin became sin for me that I might be made the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5.21. <clears throat> That's what that means. That's the theology of it. The theology of it. The transition from old covenant thinking to new covenant thinking that brings in a whole new wave of theology <clears throat> that these apostles were responsible for when he left. And were they faithful? Listen. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they wrote it. They wrote the transition. Luke comes along and writes the book of Luke, volume 1, and Acts, volume 2, and shows you the struggle the church had in this transition doctrine time. Listen, it's not easy to pull people out of law into grace. It's not easy. Because it, listen, and it shouldn't be easy because it involves faith. It involves faith. But you really have to understand why the new covenant is supreme over the old covenant. That is the book of Hebrews. The whole book of Hebrews. <clears throat> we read in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul writes, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, is what Jesus said. And as often as you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. 
It's a powerful idea. It's a powerful idea. Here's another one. It's not on your paper, I doubt. Galatians 4, 4 and 5. Galatians 4 and 5 says something really interesting. It says that the Messiah would be and was born to under the law. Verse 5 says, in order to redeem those who were under the law. <laughs> you know what that redeem is? That's the exodus. That's the fulfillment of all that business. To redeem those. See, don't miss verse 5. Law can't do it. Law can't redeem you. All it can do is condemn you. And boy, does it do a good job of that. <laughs> Here's the second point. During the ministry of Jesus Christ, and th people miss this. When they study this, people miss this. And this is something you should not miss. During the very ministry time of Jesus Christ, there were three different religious groups of disciples. And they were well known. They were like th three denominations. <clears throat> they were well known in the community. Listen to me. And all of their followers were called disciples. Mathetes, M-A-T-H-E-T-E-S. That's the noun form of Montano. Montano means to learn, or a Mathetes is a learner of a master teacher. Jesus would say, a student is not above his master, is not above his teacher. That's why you're a student. <laughs> when you become a peer, you're, don't, you're not called a student. You're called a teacher. All three of these groups had followers called disciples. And they were well known. In Mark, the second chapter, verse 18, I wrote on your paper, John's disciples and the Pharisees' disciples were fasting. And they came and they said to him, Jesus Christ, why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not? His answer was really good. It's not my subject today. I'm not going to teach on it. But if you get into the reading of that, it do you some good to read his answer to that question. Because it deals with the first coming of what, what the purpose of the first coming of Christ was about. was his answer. Well, if you understood why the Messiah should come at all, then that wouldn't be a big question to you. My point, though, is that John, is, when we say John's disciple, we're talking about John the Baptist. John the Baptist had disciples. Mathetes. The Pharisees had them, and Jesus had them. You understand that? All right. It's important you understand. These three groups were running around. These are three theology groups. An example of John's doctrines, John the Baptist doctrines, was given in John the first chapter, verses 15 through 34. I will tell you ahead of time how you should read that. Now, I ain't got time today because I'm limited on time. I don't have time to teach this to you. But I'm going to give you a heads up on how to read 15 through 34. Can I do that? Now, you're going to have to write this down. If it's important, you're going to need to write this down. If it's not important, then, you know. 
It's not important. <laughs> Three times in this passage, John says three things it, it recorded by John in verse 15, 19, and then I think maybe 32. He says, John's testimony, the testimony of John, verse 15, verse 19, verse 32. Now, this is really important. Those three headings are going to give you five testimonies of John that are recorded in the Word of God. That was his assignment, and that's what he taught his disciples. If you want to know what John, the master teacher, taught and had disciples who wanted to learn it, you can read John, the first chapter, 15 through 34. There are five testimonies. There are five doctrines that he gives. And make sure you follow it. He tells you three times, this is John's testimony. This is what the master teacher of those disciples were teaching them. And listen, it was all about Jesus Christ. The coming, the coming of the Messiah. And John was to look for certain things and was to gather a people. And he quotes his calling out of Isaiah 40. And he is quoted in that passage, the gather of people for the coming of the Messiah. John considered himself one called out of the wilderness to go to the city and go back to the wilderness and go to the city and go back to the wilderness and tell the people, John, why are you on the wilderness? It's going to take a while. You're going to have, a, have to have a large space because my job is to gather a large group for the coming of the Messiah. So he'd go into the city, and then he'd tease them out to the wilderness, and they, the, they, large crowds would grow in the wilderness because you're going to have to have a large arena to hold all the people. My job is to gather them, gather them, gather them, gather them, gather them, gather them for the coming. It's just a wonderful... John taught his disciples. And when, when John saw that Jesus of Nazareth, his cousin, was the Messiah, he told his disciples to follow him that his ministry was over. You remember that? He, he must increase, I must decrease. That, that's pretty much a ministry over. And he told them to follow him. And some did and some didn't. Some stayed with the old master rather than to go what he told them to go. John's disciples, John taught his disciples what God taught him to do. And they gathered a large gathering of people for the coming of Messiah. He started, a, John stirred up a hornet's nest. <laughs> he stirred up a hornet's nest that Jesus would gather around. He stirred up a hornet's nest so when Jesus came, he could step into the hornet's nest. But that was his job. That was his job, and he did it well. So when you read verses 15 through 18, that's one testimony. 19 through 22, that's another testimony. 24 through 28, that's another testimony. 29 through 31, it's another testimony. 32 through 34 is another testimony. That's five areas of doctrine that he taught his disciples that's just in a short period of time of Scripture. I'm just showing you he had disciples, and that was his responsibility to, to, to teach them, to teach them. They're called disciples. They're learners, and they're teachers. The Pharisees had them. The Pharisees had them. The Pharisees' doctrine, you can look at this mess in Mark, the 7th chapter, 1 through 13. Again, in John, the 9th chapter, 27 through 34. Hey, to go back just a moment to John's disciples, John's disciples, Paul, on a third missionary trip in the book of Acts, was in Ephesus, and met some of the disciples of John, 
who didn't have a clue about how the, the story was supposed to end once Christ came. And he brought him, he, Paul incorporated the disciples of John the Baptist into the church. They didn't know it was about the church. The Christ in Acts 20, 28 died for the church. Paul had to explain it to him. And what you have in the book of Acts written by Luke is for Pentecost. You have a Pentecost in Acts 2. One in eight, you have the Jews, the Samaritans. In 19, you pick up the, the disciples of John the Baptist. In, in uh, chapter 10 and 11, you pick up Gentiles. And in chapter 19, you pick up the disciples of John that are lost wandering around out there. Because they didn't pay any attention when John said, the whole thing is about Jesus Christ, I'll pay attention to him. Guess how many disciples he found? When he found John's disciples, guess how many they had? That's a gate question. No doubt about it. I'm not going to tell you. But it is interesting how many they had. It is interesting. It would be well worth your time to read the 19th chapter, verse 7 on your own sometime. Not on my time. So we have the Pharisees. Of course, they're about the law. They're not going to give up the law. They don't care if Jesus fulfills it or not. They're going to, not going to give it up. It came from Moses, and they're staying with it. Well, what about Abraham? I don't care. Moses overtook Abraham. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. No, Abraham trumps him because Abraham has the covenant of promise of the seed. And the law condemns you if you don't believe that seed. You do know that. An example of Jesus' doctrines are given in John the fourth chapter, 25 through 38. That's the woman at the well. I chose her. There, I could have chose a whole lot of different ones. I chose her because we're in Samaria. And the people came out because of the woman's testimony that she believes she just met the Messiah, Christ the Messiah. She goes back in and says, ah, I think I just met the Messiah down at, the, down at Jacob's well. And they weren't like, I don't think so. Ah, I tell you, it's for true. So they take a look. They spend some time with him themselves and go like, ah, he's, it's the Messiah. He's in Samaria. This is what they say. I'm in John 4, 42. It's a great passage. And they were saying to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this one, this man, Jesus from Nazareth, this Galilean, is indeed the Savior of the world. Do you know that the Samaritans were looking for him? She told them they were looking for him. They told them they were looking for him, and they found him. The Jews didn't find him, and they did. Never know, do you? Never pass up anybody. Disciples passed her up, passed her up twice. They passed her up on their way. She probably passed them and said, what are you looking at? I'm just thinking. I'd have wrote that in my book. Because they didn't pay any attention to her as a person in need of the gospel. She got down with Jesus. Jesus knew why he was at the well. Listen, listen, you ought to know where you are when the opportunity comes to you. It don't matter if you're in the store. It doesn't matter if you're at the service station. It doesn't matter if you're at the hospital. It doesn't matter if you're sitting in the 
in the chair and they're about to drill a hole in your tooth or something. You got to like hold them in it. I've got something to say to you before you drill me anymore. Or maybe it might be wise to wait until it's through and then tell them. Listen, when the Holy Spirit nudges you, you should respond to that. That's my advice for you. That's the advice that I learned. You're going like, well, you know, I'm in a hurry. Look at You're never in a hurry until you go past the number of hours that Jesus was on the cross. Nothing more important in this life than bringing someone else the message of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's nothing more important in this life, and you'll learn it in the next one. Why not learn it in this one? Here's Luke, the, here's Luke, the second chapter, verse 11, not on your paper. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Angel from heaven declaring to the world, planet Earth, the world called planet Earth, that marvelous statement, sent from heaven, apostleship, sent from heaven on a mission. The disciples of Jesus became known as the Twelve. In Luke, the ninth chapter, verse 1 and 12, they were known as the Twelve. Death to Ark of the Twelve. The Twelve. After the death of Judas, in Luke 24, 9, they're called the Eleven. Later, they'll go back and be called the Twelve historically. When we refer to the Twelve, we refer to them as the Twelve. Now, many of us, we refer to him the 12 because we believe that Paul was added in the place of Judas. But they referred to him as the 12 even after that. What is interesting to me, at Antioch of Syria, at Antioch of Syria, the disciples of Jesus... The disciples of Jesus were called Christians. You know what's interesting about that? These are Gentiles. It's this first Gentile church. This whole Acts 11, where they come into being, all comes out of this great wave of, convert, of taking the gospel to the Gentiles in chapter 10 of, of Acts. Chapter 10 of Acts, you have Cornelius picked up. And now, boy... This has turned into quite a, quite a deal because Acts 1.8 says, go to, go, start in Jerusalem, go to Judea, go to Samaria, and go to the uttermost parts of the earth. That's the book of Acts. They follow that roadmap. You know, you know what wound up to be the uttermost parts of the earth? The Roman Empire. Think about one guy conquers the Roman Empire for Christ in a lifetime, and a short one at that. You can read about this. Ju Listen, how did, how did Gentiles get saved without any of the apostles, any of the disciples of Christ, the 12, doing that? How did they get saved without the 12 doing it? Acts 11, chapter verse 20 tells you. Acts 11, chapter verse 20 says, there were Jewish missionaries who left Pentecost, the meeting of Acts 2, so from Cyprus, who went there and evangelized them. And all of a sudden, news has gotten back to Jerusalem, to the 12, and the 12 sent Barnabas up there to check it out. Barnabas got up there and said, holy cow, or, or something of that. Uh, maybe not cow, but anyhow, 
holy anyhow. I think these people are legit. I think a whole bunch of Gentiles up here. And they went, well, we need some teaching. And he said, okay. He runs and gets Paul. Brings Paul and those two guys plant a church, a Gentile church. Now you have a church in Jerusalem, Jewish, Christian. Now you have one Gentile that started in Acts 10. And that little church is going to send Paul and Barnabas and later Paul and Silas. Listen, they sent one team out. They had a little trouble. The next time, he, they, that little church sent two out, two teams out. You know what they said? You guys get along. Go on, get out there and do what you're supposed to do. Hey, come over here. Let's get another team going. Quit fussing and preach the gospel of Christ. That little church is responsible for enormous evangelism. Boom, right there. They are formed in chapter 11. They bring Paul in, his great ministry in 12. And they're into foreign missions 13 through 26. I bet that took a lot of money. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. They never raised any, so I don't know. It never says they did it. But they sure sent them. Because these guys were willing to go because God sent them. If the little church had said, well, we don't have any money to send you, you think Paul said, well, I guess I can't go then, right? <laughs> you know anything about the apostle Paul? Oh, jeez. Is that well, we'll go as far as we can get. How far can we get on five dollars? That's how far we're going. We'll stop and preach and we'll work until we get another five and we'll go on until we get to where we're supposed to go. That's how they traveled. That was missionary evangelism. The church of Jesus Christ has spoiled their ministers. They think everything has got to be about money. It's never about money. Never. Where does your call come from? If it comes from the master, then he's got, your, he's got to the supplies. Either he takes care of all your needs or he takes care of none of them. Because either he's doing it or you're doing it. That's like nothing. Well... Here's what we're talking about. Listen, the way he supplies it is he puts you on the mission field and helps you, supports you, and gets you through it. Paul would be on a mission field. Listen, Paul wasn't at home building tents. He was on the mission field building tents to get from point A to point B. <laughs> he was working at Walmart, you know. Picked up a Walmart store, worked a little while, and got, got down further down the road. You'd have been lucky to work with him at Walmart because he'd have got you saved. <laughs> I guarantee you that. Well, I th had three points because I knew I could get through them. I let them out early today, I said. A poem. God had a little lamb and he died on the cross for us. It was Mary's little lamb, by the way. Let's have a word of prayer, and we'll take the offering. Thanks for asking for that poem, though. I didn't have it on my paper. I Heavenly Father, we're thankful today for these that have come our way, both by automobile and Internet, to study with us. I pray we're still learners, and we're missionaries. We don't call them apostles anymore. We call them missionaries. Those who are sent by God, equipped and trained by the church to be able to go out, teach the truth of God, weather the storm and the adversities, and train on the mission field as if it was the home church. 
with responsibilities. Lead, train, guide. Because they were good learners, they're good missionaries. If they're not good learners, they're not good missionaries. They're, they're false missionaries. I thank you, Father, for being steadfast in the word of God. A church that does not waver on the principle of grace, nor the truth of the word of God, nor the principle of people need milk and they need meat. And the church is responsible for evangelizing their community the farther ends, to the farther ends of the earth of communities. We take that command serious, Father. We take it serious. Take this offering we offer today, Father, because it comes from the heart. It doesn't come from the law. It comes from grace. As given to me, we give to others. We give to the work of the church because we believe in it. And we make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.